Hey everybody, welcome to Tony T's Tune Talk, available here at the Port Washington Public Library's YouTube channel. I'm your host, Tony Chiguardo, and I'm ready to talk tunes. In the last episode of this series, I looked at some of the many fine groups other than the Beatles and some of their most famous contemporaries that were making great music and having hits here in the U.S. during what was called the British Invasion. On today's Tune Talk, let's look at a few more of them. Peter Asher's father, Richard Asher, was a medical consultant, and his mother, Margaret, was a professor at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Margaret Asher had an accomplished student whose name was George Martin. Yes, that George Martin. Anyway, Peter Asher began acting professionally when he was eight years old. Peter's sister, Jane, was also an actress who interviewed the Beatles at the Royal Albert Hall in London when she was just 17. This planted the seed of what would result in a five-year relationship with Paul McCartney. But before you ask, the song Saw Her Standing There was written years before he met Asher. Anyway, Peter could sing as well as act. And while he was at school in Westminster, he met fellow pupil Gordon Waller and the two began playing and singing together as a duo in coffee bars. In 1962, they started formally working together as Peter and Gordon. Their first and biggest hit was a song written by Peter's sister's boyfriend in 1964, Paul McCartney's A World Without Love. Now, this doesn't take away anything from the duo's talent, and they had plenty of it. But when you're talented and gifted with a song from a Beatle in 1964, well, let's just say you're probably going to be on your way. And Peter and Gordon certainly were. Once Peter and Gordon hit the charts, a number of other beautifully performed and produced Paul McCartney compositions, all legally credited to Lennon McCartney, helped to keep them there. Nobody I Know would reach number 12 in the United States, I Don't Want to See You Again would reach number 16 in the United States. And finally, there was the song called Woman. The sweeping orchestrated ballad Woman was written by Paul McCartney under the pseudonym Bernard Webb. Now the idea was to see whether he could have a hit song without his name directly attached to it. Well, a great record is a great record. And Woman reached number 14 in the United States and number 28 on the UK singles chart in 1966. Peter and Gordon also recorded a fine version of the John Lennon penned Lennon McCartney song, If I Fell, which the Beatles had recorded for their 1964 soundtrack album to A Hard Day's Night. Like the Beatles and many other British invasion acts, the duo added to their US fan base by making appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show and Shindig. It's a testimony to Peter and Gordon's appeal and talent that their success continued long after they broke away from recording Lennon-McCartney compositions for their singles. I Go to Pieces, which reached the U.S. Top 10, was written by the late, great Del Shannon and given to Peter and Gordon after the two acts had toured together. The duo also hit the Top 40 here with covers of Buddy Holly's True Love Ways and the Teddy Bears' To Know Him Is To Love Him, which they retitled as To Know You Is To Love You. Peter and Gordon's delightful Lady Godiva hit number 16 here in the U.S. in 1966, and the duo made it into the upper reaches of the Billboard Hot 100 in 1967 with both Night in Rusty Armor and Sunday for Tea. Peter and Gordon released four albums in 1967, but the duo finally called it quits at that point. They reunited on occasion until 1975. And Peter Asher went on to become a highly successful producer, A&R man, and manager who worked over the years with such moderately successful acts as um, Linda Ronstadt, uh, James Taylor, uh, Cher, and 10,000 Maniacs. In August of 2005, Peter and Gordon reunited on stage for the first time in more than 30 years as part of two tribute concerts in New York City for Mike Smith the former lead singer of the Dave Clark Five, who had been in a devastating accident. The duo's friend, Paul McCartney, heard about the duo's appearance 
and sent them a message to congratulate them on their reunion. My wife and I were honored to have been in attendance. The duo would continue to delight audiences, performing mostly in the U.S., until Gordon Waller's unexpected death from a heart attack in 2009. The earliest version of the group, the Dave Clark Five, was formed in the British town of Tottenham in 1957. Once their final lineup, featuring the band's producer and business manager Dave Clark on drums, was in place, they would establish themselves as the vanguard of the Tottenham sound. This placed them, of course, in direct competition with the Beatles' Mersey Beat sound. In 1964, the Dave Clark Five kicked off their recording career with the single Glad All Over, a song that knocked the Beatles' I Wanna Hold Your Hand off the top of the UK singles chart. It also made its way to number six in the United States in April of 1964. The song was the first of 12 top 40 hits the band would score in the UK between 1964 and 1967, and of 17 records, including Catch Us If You Can, Any Way You Want It, and Bits and Pieces, that would reach the top 40 of the U.S. Billboard chart. They even topped that same chart in December of 1965 with a cover version of Bobby Day's Over and Over. And the band's many hits all featured Mike Smith's powerful rock and roll voice, a favorite of a budding young rocker named Bruce Springsteen, front and center. With Smith as their front man, the Dave Clark Five would make 13 appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show more than any other British Invasion group. Dave Clark managed to strike business deals that allowed him to produce the band's recordings and gave him control of their master tapes, an unprecedented arrangement at the time. Songwriting credits were often given to various combinations of band members, even though Dave Clark's close friend Ron Ryan actually wrote many of the songs. Credit should also be given here to session drummer Bobby Graham, who played sometimes alongside Clark, on many of the band's biggest hits. After their string of successes, including a period in the mid-60s where they were being touted as supposed rivals to the Beatles on the front cover of every teen magazine in the U.S., the Dave Clark Five disbanded in 1970. Sadly, the group's frontman Mike Smith passed away only 11 days before the group's induction by actor Tom Hanks into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2008. Despite a number of changes in personnel over the course of their 50 plus year history, the Manchester based group The Hollies have landed multiple hits in the US and the UK. And they've also been a major influence on many musicians who grew up as fans of 60s and 70s music. Grammar school friends Alan Clark and Graham Nash began performing together as an Everly Brothers style duo in 1960. They formed the Hollies in 1962, and despite the fact that they were from Manchester, they adopted a Mersey Beat style. The group's name was inspired by Bill Haley and the Comets. Wait, what? No, no. It came about, of course, from a deep admiration for the late, great Buddy Holly. In January of 1963, one of the Holly's performances at the Cavern Club in Liverpool was witnessed by Parlophone assistant producer Ron Richards. Richards had been involved in producing the first Beatles session, and he wisely offered the Hollies an audition with his label, which they passed with flying colors. In fact, a song from their audition, a cover of the Coaster's hit, Ain't That Just Like Me, was released as the Hollies' debut in May of 1963. It reached number 25 on the UK charts, and the Hollies were off and running. Ron Richards would be the sole producer of the group until 1976, so he was at the helm for their second single, another Coasters cover, and this time Searchin' would reach the British Top 20. Some personnel changes occurred before they would score their first British Top 10 hit early in 1964 with a cover of Maurice Williams and the Zodiac's Stay. The band's Parlophone album debut, Stay with the Hollies, was released on New Year's Day 1964, and that album quickly reached number two in the UK. The Hollies hit it big again with a cover of Doris Troy's Just One Look, followed by Here I Go Again, which reached a respectable number four in England. At this point, the US were finally introduced to the group courtesy of an album also entitled 
Here I Go Again. The Hollies began introducing original material written by the group's songwriting team of Clark, Nash, and Hicks into their repertoire. So Ron Richards allowed the group to release their first self-penned single, We're Through, credited to a pseudonym. And actually, L. Ransford, the name of Graham Nash's grandfather, would be the name that would appear in the writing credits of many of the band's early singles. Ron Richards' faith in his talented charges awarded them all with a number seven UK hit. Two additional cover versions, Yes I Will and I'm Alive, kept the group on the British charts for the first half of 1964. The group had yet to hit it big in the States, but the North American breakthrough for the Hollies would come in mid-1965 from the pen of one of Manchester's young songwriters, Graham Gouldman. Look Through Any Window broke the Hollies into the U.S. Top 40 and the Canadian Top 10, both for the first time. A few follow-up singles failed to break into the upper echelons of the U.S. charts, but tracks like The Hollies, I'm Alive, and their take on George Harrison's If I Needed Someone are classic songs from the era. Thankfully, The Hollies did return to the U.K. Top 10 that year with I Can't Let Go. 1966 brought more personnel changes, along with the single After the Fox, a movie theme that featured Peter Sellers on guest vocals. Another Gouldman song, Bus Stop, would give the Hollies their first U.S. Top 10 single. As a result, a North American album release called Bus Stop combined the single with unreleased songs from earlier in the band's career, and that climbed to number 75, the group's first album, to enter the U.S. Top 100 album charts. In that same year, Clark, Nash, and Hicks participated, along with session guitarist Jimmy Page, uh, bass guitarist John Paul Jones, and a pianist named Reg Dwight, who we all know better as Elton John, in the recording of the Everly Brothers' wonderful 1966 album, Two Yanks in England. The album featured the duo performing mostly covers of songs written by L. Ransford. After the Everly Brothers album, all but one of the Hollies' single A-sides were original compositions credited to the band. The group's fifth album, For Certain Because, was the group's first to contain only compositions by Clark, Nash, and Hicks. The U.S. version, renamed for their U.S. Top 10 single, Stop, 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 reached number 91. And the album also yielded the U.S. only Top 40 single, I'll Pay You Back With Interest. A steady stream of international hit singles followed. Anna Carousel reached number 11 here. And the classic Carrie Ann, which peaked at number three, was also included on their 1967 album, Evolution. Released by their new U.S. label, Epic Records, on June 1st, 1967, the very same day as the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It reached an impressive number 13 here. Graham Nash had attempted to expand the band's range with some more ambitious compositions, and a few fantastic Nash songs were released as singles. But King Midas in Reverse and Dear Eloise stalled in the middle of the top 100 singles charts in the U.S. In response to those disappointments, Clark and Nash wrote the close-to-bubblegum song Jennifer Eccles. Predictably, that song hit the top 40. But a rift began to develop as Clark and Hicks were interested in recording more pop material than Graham Nash was. Things finally came to a head when the band rejected Nash's song Marrakesh Express and decided to record an album made up entirely of Bob Dylan covers instead. Graham Nash would soon depart from the Hollies, stating that he had tired of touring. He moved to California, taking Marrakesh Express with him, and fell in with these two other fellows whose last names began with C and S. Of course, being the N in Crosby, Stills, and Nash, CSN, would make him a superstar. But it was not over by any means for the Hollies. Various Graham Nashless versions of the group would place nine more singles into the UK Top 40 and the US Top 100 between 1968 and 1975. Such pop classics as He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother, 
a song that featured the newly renamed Elton John on the piano, the rockin' long cool woman in a black dress, a number two platinum selling smash, long dark road, and the beautiful air that I breathe all helped to make the Hollies one of the most important bands that had made their way over during the British invasion. The Hollies toured extensively throughout the 1980s as a classic rock band, and the group's reunion single with Graham Nash, a cover of the Supremes hit Stop in the Name of Love, awarded the band with the rare distinction of having had top 40 hits in the United States in three consecutive decades. The Hollies, with and without Graham Nash, continue to occasionally reunite on stage and have even recorded new songs for tribute albums, charity records, and Hollies compilations. Their most recent release, the lovely and very modern sounding song Skylarks, was released in 2014 on the Hollies CD compilation 50 at 50. I know there is much more British ground for me to cover, but that's going to be as far as I go on this episode of Tony T's Tune Talk. I hope that you'll explore some of the music I've talked about today. And again, be sure to look for it on the excellent digital resources and streaming services available through your local library. Thanks for watching and happy listening.